Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guests today are from the Roanoke Regional Partnership, which recently debuted its Thrive 2027 five-year strategic plan. John Hall is the executive director for the partnership. Paul Nestor is president of RGC Resources and co-chair of the Thrive 2027 fundraising campaign, which we'll learn all about on today's show. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Gene. Thank you, Gene. Uh, Thrive 2027 is looking to raise 3.6 million or more by this spring, and uh, local governments have pledged to match that total uh, over the next few years. And you entered the public phase of the campaign with pledges already from uh, local businesses close to $3 million. Um, was this an easy sell maybe for some businesses as far as what you wanted to do with Thrive 2027? Yeah, Gene, you know, I think, I think the business community has shown a great deal of support for what we've done, and, and, and they has done so historically at the Renwick Regional Partnership. We can, we've enjoyed support for quite some time, and, and they've really stepped up to the bat. The opportunity is, is great, greater probably than, the, uh, greater than ever before in many ways. We have some uh, leads in the pipeline of significant size, both employment-wise uh, as well as capital investment size. And, uh, and with, that, uh, with the work that we have done to prepare the market, there's a great opportunity to, to close some, some, some projects and have some impacts. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the four pillars, but Paul, when you go out and you, you're one of the co-chairs and you ask for money, what is it that businesses are telling you that they want you to, how you, they want you to use that money? Yeah. To get more bang for their buck. Yeah, and Gene, to your earlier question, I think the sale has been a little easier because we have so many good things happening in the Roanoke Valley. Uh, not only from an economic development standpoint, as John just mentioned, but from a quality of life, a lot of positive momentum. So uh, businesses are interested in that. They want to contribute to that. They want to help. Um, and they certainly understand that economic development is so important to the momentum continuing. You know, your predecessor, Beth Dowdy, I think it was about 10 years ago, she went before the local governments and threw down the gauntlet of, we need to do more to promote the outdoors. Right. I remember Beth saying that, uh, there's people in the valley that don't even know how to get to the Appalachian Trail, that type of thing. So you think the track record, John, over the past decade or so of promoting the outdoors with the help of Visit, Visit Virginia's Blue Ridge and all that, to attract businesses and people, do you think that as you get into Thrive 2027, that gives you a good track record, that you've, you've taken advantage of that, that tact? Well, without question, Gene. And, you know, livability and placemaking is a big, a big pillar of our plan. Uh, but the outdoors, not only have we been telling the story and building community, We've been actively investing to make it better. You know, since 2020, we've had the Project Outside program. It's, uh, it attracts uh, donations of businesses and individuals alike. And we've invested $150,000 uh, of those donations in new infrastructure and support for, for building new infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, again, we're, we're not just telling a story, we're making it better. And I've talked to Pete Eshelman about Project Outside recently, and uh, I know that uh, they're looking for even for the next round of, of grant giving, uh, even just things that low, you know, citizens have they want to see in their community may not doesn't have to be a grandiose project or something so uh, and that's one way to attract more funds to something like that you, where, where people feel feel like their money can make a difference no question about it gene i think you know um, you think about the kayak launches and some of the things along the river the greenway of course those are visible people of all stripes can use them very accessible uh, very amenable mm -hmm. and you were saying uh, paul before we got started that as far as your fundraising goal for 2027 thrive that uh, You'll take a little more money if you hit 3.6 and go oh, Yeah, certainly. We'd love to, to raise more than 3.6. That just was the initial goal, but um, it really is gas in the tank, and more gas in the tank is going to help John and his team do more for this region. Let's talk about the four pillars of uh, Thrive 2027. And first of all, did this replace an earlier strategic plan? Yeah, Gene, we, we, uh, we reevaluate the, the program of work every five years. Uh, this particular uh, update was important for a number of reasons. We have a new, you know, post-pandemic reality. We have some opportunities now that we didn't have before. Uh, some work was done in the previous five to ten years and it's set us up for success in, in areas such as talent attraction. I mean, the outdoors and livability, it's been a big part of our business message and it's, it's yielded success there. Um, and it has yielded success in talent attraction, and we have some opportunity to get that word out and, and mm. let people know about the opportunities in Roanoke. You know, before we get into it, uh, t you know, talk, it looks like we're coming out of the pandemic now. Knock fake wood here. Uh, did, did, did gears slip much during the last 
couple of years, John, or were, were there still people kicking the tires? Or you know, and, and if it did slip, were we in the same boat as everybody else? <clears throat> yeah, Gene, it's interesting. So in terms of the opportunity pipeline, you know, we actually finished 2020 above 2019 in spite of the pandemic. Really? We did. We had more, more interest in activity. There might have been a slow spell there right in April, May, but at, when the fall came around, folk, prospects were coming back. We had lots of uh, requests for, uh, for research and information, folks kicking the tires, and it's continually grown from there. Uh, we're, we're at a level now where we finished, uh, we finished 2021 above 2020, and so far we're on pace to, to finish above last year this year. Um, so leads are up 70% this quarter over last year to date. This just popped in my head. I want to ask you, too, because you're in the energy business, Ronald Gas, but if energy prices continue to stay up, natural gas, oil prices, is that, is that going to impact businesses that use natural gas, for instance? Oh, the, there's no question. Energy prices affect everything in our economy, both locally at the state level and nationally, of course, and even internationally. There's, there's no question, Gene, um, energy prices are, are going to uh, further contribute to some of the inflationary pressure we're seeing in the economy. And that's going to affect a lot of things. I think it affects everything. It mm. affects the food that we all eat and our energy to, to heat and cool our homes and gasoline in our vehicles. It, it's very, very important right now. I want to talk about the, the four pillars of <coughs> Thrive 2027, economic growth and innovation, talent attraction and workforce development, commercial real estate and infrastructure and placemaking and livability. Talk about the infrastructure uh, yeah. pillar yeah. and commercial real estate. I guess that's a little bit of a different approach where the partnership and its partners want to be more proactive. Talk about that. Yeah, and you know, in fact, we have a great example of that, Gene. You know, the Woodhaven Technology Park up in the corner of uh, 81 and 581. About 100 place. acres, yeah. About 100 acres, and that and that's a project that the partnership staff actually corralled and and and, and managed. Um, and we want to we want to do more of that type of activity, working with our governments, working with investors in real estate to encourage them to make the investments that that make us market ready. And, and build the opportunity pipeline. And that's exactly what Woodhaven did. That's what Franklin County did in Summit View Business Park. Uh, Botetourt County is doing some work up in Greenfield, at the Botetourt Center at Greenfield that's building opportunity. And uh, all of our governments have, have opportunity either jointly or on their own to make these investments and, and really propel us forward. Does that also c include convincing local governments to spend the money to make a site, site ready, to prep a site? So with it work, somebody can come in and see that it's already got utilities hooked up, it's flat, the whole thing. Yeah, Gene is vital. If, you know, if we don't have a site that's ready, we're not competitive. And, and the governments are making those investments. You know, Governor Yunkin announced just in January $1.4 million coming to the region for additional site preparedness at those three parks I mentioned, Woodhaven Technology Park, Botetourt Center at Greenfield, and Summit View Business Park in Franklin County. And it's key to competitiveness for us regionally. Right. And you have to do this, including getting gas hookups and all that, because other localities are doing this. No question. Economic development is frequently a check the box kind of circumstance out of the gate. Is the site there? Is it ready? Does it have sufficient energy, both natural gas and electricity? And if you don't check the box, they go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is it, John, that will convince a company to go to a place like Roanoke as opposed to a place like Greenville, South Carolina, sure. or so what? Is, is, it, is, is it so competitive that it's just one thing or the way that they're received by partnerships and local governments? Or what's the magic uh, formula there? Well, there's multiple variables, Gene, and every project's a little different. They all have their own specific requirements for utilities and real estate, but you know, generally 100 acres is a pretty important tipping point for impactful projects, and we have some opportunities there we didn't have before. Um, we, we, we have a great prospect team of our utility partners and our local governments that come out and meet with our prospects when they hit the ground. They all do a wonderful job. In terms of differentiating, a lot of, a lot of it comes down to real estate readiness and the right fit for that group. Mm -hmm. uh, but also a labor fit as well and workforce. We have great stories to tell in all those areas and we're, again, we're working on making it better. Right, talk about workforce development. Um, it seems like you know, the last few years, especially STEM training and STEM courses uh, and, and, and getting more kids interested earlier. I was just at the Salem Civic Center, and they have 8,000 7th and 8th graders coming through the Virginia Career Works and the workforce over the next couple of weeks, and there's like 30, 40 businesses there, and they just get an opportunity to see what they might. I wish that that had been around when I was in middle school. Right. Um, and just as far as keeping kids here, and how important is that to get them started early on workforce development and, and, and getting, getting them thinking about careers? Yeah, we're convinced it's more and more important, um, and I agree with you. It would have been nice to have something like that when I was um, 
uh, that age, but workforce development is certainly one of the key things that came out of our strategy for this campaign, and it's something uh, that, that's something we're all feeling even more right now. Right. Uh, we're all struggling to find quality uh, talent as some of our, in, partic in particular in our business, the folks that have been with us for many, many years are retiring. Uh, we're not finding the young people interested in that same type of work. So we think we've got to start earlier and start uh, plowing the ground or farming a little bit with younger, uh, younger folks about their opportunities. And the type of jobs you're looking for, not necessarily four-year college degrees, but good paying, that type of thing? Great paying, great benefits, uh, a lot of out, outside work, um, a fair amount of technical ability. We'll even train on the technical skill sets needed, but they're typically not uh, college degree jobs. Okay. Which not everybody's ready for four-year college degree, or they can go to school at night or something if they want to. We think there's still wonderful career opportunities. You can do very well. You can contribute and make a difference in the community and uh, provide for your family. I'm wondering, John, over the last couple of years, you know, the, the whole conundrum that we, the, the country grew more jobs last year than ever before, but there's still so many companies that are still looking for people, especially in service and hospitality and all that. Right. When you talk to people and you look at the data, and that was really your job before you took the executive uh, director position, you were the, the numbers cruncher. That's correct, Gene. Yeah, I, was, I had the research background. Okay, so talk about that, and is, do you still, is that still an issue that's hampering a lot of business, businesses from expansion or even staying in business? Yeah, Gene, you know, it's, it's, an, it's one of the reasons why we built talent attraction and workforce development into the Thrive Plan. Um, you know, Virginia's done some work from a Virginia talent accelerator angle to be more competitive, providing uh, expanding businesses and businesses coming into the region with a concierge level of service to provide them with the talent and recruitment services they need. Uh, but we're partnering, you know, for instance, with Morgan Romeo's group, the Western Virginia Workforce Development Board. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna, we have a joint strategy to communicate, you know, opportunities in the career pathways. You know, our, our side of the equation is more on talent attraction and, and quality of life and livability, but we want to provide our communications uh, services and, and strengths to, to benefit that part, that talent development side as well and partner with them. And so, you know, the opportunity is greater than ever, and we need to engage our, our youth and engage our, our workforce uh, because there's lots of opportunities and, and living wage opportunities that don't require a load of college debt. Right. And, and how much is the fact that, at least for right now, that the cost of living in the Roanoke area is, what, 15 percent lower than the national average or something? That's right. How much of an attraction is that? Is that something that you kind of wave in front of people? I think it's a significant attraction, Gene. Uh, you know, in fact, I just had a panel of, uh, of three uh, fresh new young leaders this morning in our investor update meeting, and uh, one of the points that came up was, you know, they had moved here from Northern Virginia, one moved here from New Mexico, and the cost of living advantage was significant and something they really enjoyed. The level of house that they can afford here versus where they came from. It, you know, all of these are, are key messages for us right. in, in attracting talent to this region. We had a member of your staff that was on the show. What's her name? That Taylor time? Johnson. Taylor Johnson, Morgan Morgan's sister. That's right. And she <laughs> is like the poster girl for someone who moved out and went to Northern Virginia, and, you know, discovered, what, eight, ten years later, hey, you know what? I miss, I miss having a yard that I can afford and that type of thing, and she came back. Do you, I don't know if they call that the boomerang effect or what, but do you, do you think that, are, are, are you seeing any of that? Or anecdotally, are you hearing anything about that? Oh, without question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we started five years ago focusing on the colleges and universities and the college students that are here, and we, and we continue to do that work. But what we found throughout the years is there's a lot of opportunity in what we call the boomerangs. Uh -huh. These are folks that have moved away. They've gone to a higher, a higher cost market. They've started families, many of which had wonderful experiences growing up here or studying here, and the opportunity is significant to bring those folks back. Well, maybe my kids will come back. I lost both my kids to Tampa. Uh, and, you know, the whole thing is like, especially like, how do we get more kids to stay here with, when they get out of Virginia Tech or they get out of Radford? Uh, They've got to have the opportunities. Right. And I think that's really what the Thrive 2027 campaign hopefully will afford us. Um, and they need to see that opportunity earlier. They need to see that opportunity earlier. No, mm. no doubt. Um, John, you've been with the regional partnership for how long now? This is my 12th year at the okay. partnership. What is, what's been the main shift? Is, has there been a main shift in the, in, in how the regional partnership works with partners mm -hmm. uh, in the region uh, in, the, in the way you approach talent attraction and, and business attraction. Is it, has it been any kind of huge shift? 
you know, I'd, I'd say we had a focus on the outdoors and livability from the start. It was a key message in differentiating Roanoke from other markets. Uh, so I wouldn't say there's a shift there. I would say, Gene, that the shift has been in some of the real estate preparedness that has propelled us forward and got us some opportunities now that we didn't have before. And that seems to be a big thing, real estate preparedness infrastructure. That is this, are you seeing this evidence in other places that they're really putting a focus on that so that a, a prospect can come in and say, I can start building next month? Well, Gene, if, you know, there's, there's voices throughout the Commonwealth right now that are talking about site preparedness. And I think I'm actually proud of the fact that the Roanoke region was early to the table you know, with, with the Regional Industrial Facility Authority doing regional investments and, and making those investments to prepare real estate. It's about reducing the risk and providing a speed to market solution to business. And the governments have done the work here to do that. Talk about Summit View Park a little bit more in Franklin County. It seems like they've done a really good job of getting off the ground. They're incorporating amenities for local residents as well, you know, when it's all said and done, trails and all that. So is that a good model for some of the business parks in the area? Without question, it's a beautiful park and it sets us up for success in the years ahead. Yeah, it's Plus a, a good view. Yeah, we've been happy to partner with Franklin County and, and uh, you know, hope to develop natural gas service in the park. Of course, it is dependent on the Mountain Valley Pipeline, but right. to John's point, it is a beautiful property, but it's got the size that this region needs to attract um, a large or larger businesses. Mm -hmm. And natural gas is something, Paul, that a lot of manufacturing businesses use. How do they use natural gas? Um, it's typically in their uh, production processes. Uh, certainly if they have uh, heat, if it's a plastics business, as an example, in their extrusion, certainly a metals business requires tremendous amounts of natural gas. In fact, a lot of the um, electric vehicle manufacturing you know, there's been a lot of talk about those plants that have, or facilities that have located in Tennessee and other places. There's still opportunities for more of those type facilities in Virginia. Uh, they use tremendous amounts of natural gas in their manufacturing. So but, if and when the Mountain Valley Pipeline gets done, I know that you've got a, I guess a line that'll go right by Summit View. And it all is that. actually in the park okay. itself. And will that be uh, something to help attract businesses to the region if they can get, you know, uh, affordable natural gas? Natural gas is often a requirement, uh, even, even for space heating in large, large structures. You know, Paul, when the, the Thrive 2027 campaign kicked off, you said that uh, it's important that we as a region and as a state remain competitive. Uh, are we holding our own? Are we competitive? Does it get tougher all the time to remain in the game? I think uh, it gets tougher all the time to remain in the game, but I do think our region is very competitive. I think the support we've had from the businesses so far in the campaign is going to help us remain competitive and um, I think our state's more competitive now than even six months ago. I think to your earlier question about some of the other parks, you know, Commonwealth Crossing in Henry County, Berry Hill near Danville, those are large properties. Uh, they are more competitive. Again, the governor's funding of property uh, developments meaningful. Right. It's a matter of getting people trained also and, and, and letting, them, letting them see a vision, but I want to work here, that type of thing. Yes, we, I, I credit John and Taylor and his group. They really have uh, started to bring the business community together, together to talk more about how do we retain our talent. We have such incredible higher education uh, in southwest Virginia, and a lot of those folks come here and go to school here and enjoy their experience here, and then they go back. Right. So how do we keep those folks? John and Taylor are doing a wonderful job on uh, trying to improve that. You know, I wonder over the past couple of years, John, uh, remote working became a big thing with the pandemic. Um, do you see evidence that some of that will remain in place and I'll, maybe you can work for a company in Nova but still live here? Yeah, in fact, you know, we had a panel this morning and, and had a, uh, a remote worker, uh, someone who uh, had grown up here, moved to no Northern Virginia, found their way down to Charleston, South Carolina. When their company went remote, they came back. They took really? a job with them. And, and, the, and that's happening anecdotally, it's difficult to track, but certainly we're hearing that story, we know it's happening, and, and we think the opportunity is greater than ever before to get those remote workers into this market as a new source of talent for our businesses. Well, as the next New Yorker, the thing I really like about the Roanoke area is the lack of traffic. I mean, although 81 can be a bear at times, and I'm wondering if some of the um, improvements they're gonna make on 81 will, will, will help as far as getting trucks through the region, that type of thing. You know, without question, I think transportation improvements are, are key. Uh, we're, I think the state is uh, achieving more of that state investment in, in transportation infrastructure. It's very important for us. And uh, we'll have a second Amtrak train soon. We'll have a train going to the NRV. Uh, hopefully we'll get some more service out of 
uh, the airport. How, how important is it to grow that transportation network? Hugely important. Um, not only the improvements to the Interstate 81 corridor, but even the 220 corridor, again, by some of you, you know, that, that really needs major investment over time. The airport is still a big deal. And, is it? Um, uh, getting some service to additional cities. Mike Stewart is uh, doing a great job over there and working on that. Um, but we've got to have some investment there. Uh, longer runway, bigger planes. That's all meaningful to what John and his team are doing in terms of attracting right. business. Because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there are some companies that will not come here because because of the more limited air service. That's a fact. I would say there there are opportunities that we never even know of, you know, for yes. instance, because they, we're not evaluated right. potentially because of air service, yes. Right, they, they want a one, one stop from here to wherever they have to go. The infrastructure is a huge piece right. of the, the competitive uh, puzzle. Hmm. Uh, I've got a few minutes left uh, before we talk about some of your goals. Let's look back at the last five years, 3,255 direct and indirect jobs, $527 million in new capital investments and increase in per capita income by 15%. And that's, I guess, what some of the COVID years fact factored, and that's that's pretty good. Yeah, Gene, I, we're 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 proud of the work that we've done, and we think we think there's opportunity to to really, uh, you know, achieve even higher results, even greater results in the next five years. And now you're looking for 3,000 new primary jobs, 3,100 new secondary jobs, 350 million dollars in investment, and another, I guess, 15 percent increase in per capita income. Talk exactly about the the seven million dollars or so that you're raising with Thrive 2027. How is it going to be used? What is it going to be used for? Sure, sure. Yeah, we, we have a number of marketing strategies. You know, there's, there's opportunity to get into new media now better than, you know, ever than before with the social media and with video, with getting that message out there in a way that is shareable, that is, uh, that is enticing to the viewer, um, you know, not just flat reading something. You know, there's opportunity to get out there and really make, make a strong pitch. And it's about getting, raising the profile of Roanoke. And so it, it's marketing strategies. It's going out to meet with consultants and gatekeepers, meet with businesses, meet with industry, spreading the word about Roanoke, Virginia, mm. and, and the Roanoke region and the opportunity to invest. And of course, it's also about attracting talent, continuing our outdoor programs, building that outdoor community. Um, those four areas, again, placemaking, livability, commercial real estate and infrastructure, talent and workforce development, and economic growth and innovation. What are you hearing, Paul? You're also a board member for the Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce, I believe. What are you hearing about? You hear optimism out there when you talk to businesses and local leaders? No, no question. Uh, we've got uh, a tremendous uh, positive vibe here in the Roanoke Valley, and it's uh, really due to the work uh, of the last 10 to 20 years that, that we've discussed here uh, some today that's put us in a nice position to continue to move forward and do great things. Certainly what's happened downtown with the um, Virginia Tech Carilion Partnership has been transformational. Um, it's uh, something that's noticed around the country and around the world. The research that's being done uh, with Michael Friedlander and his group is nothing short of spectacular. So we do have a lot of uh, foundation, a lot of positive momentum. The business community is very enthused uh, with John and the partnership and the chamber. Uh, the chamber and Joyce and her team work very well with, with John and we're thrilled about that. We think that's so, so important. What our local governments are doing now to actually work together and their participation in the Thrive campaign was meaningful. Really? No, no doubt. In terms of setting this strategy, the collaboration with the business community, the local governments, and even folks from the not-for-profit community participated, higher education, um, it, it has given us a great strategy to proceed over the next five years. You know, you mentioned, uh, since you mentioned Michael Friedlander and the FBRI, I, I, and I might have asked this before, but are you looking for bigger things in the future as far as spin-offs from the FBRI? I know they want to set up a, a shared wet dry lab, and even from the ramp people. Uh, are there, is there more opportunity to, to help nurture those spin-offs and grow more jobs? Yeah, Gene, I mean, Growing innovation, you know, is, is a key opportunity and getting those spinoffs, uh, but also spreading the word and attracting, you know, attracting businesses in the innovation space. I, I think it's quite, quite a broad uh, opportunity, you know, from, from small outfits that might be working in the downtown or, the, or along the innovation corridor to manufacturers that, that manufacture in, for healthcare. Uh, or in the innovation space, um, you know, autonomous vehicles and, and electronics and so forth who might, might need the larger real estate. So the, the opportunity is, is broad and, and with Virginia Tech's investment and their presence in this, in this larger region, it really sets us up for success. You know, it's interesting, Virginia Tech, when I got here, they were 
40 miles down the road, but to have their presence here in medical school and the Research Institute, it, it, it just brings it to a whole different level, I would imagine, as far as their investment in this area. Absolutely, and, and, it, and it's a showpiece, and it's a, a big part of our regional message. Right, got it just the last minute or so. Uh, real quickly from both of you, are, are we in a good place as Thrive 2027 gets off the ground? Oh, we're in a great place, and we want to finish the campaign strong, and again, we'd love to exceed the goal by 10 or 15%. When do you think we'll see some of the first evidence, John, that Thrive 2027 is taking root? Oh, I think we'll have some success this year for sure. Uh, in, our, in our first year as we implement Thrive 2027, uh, we'll be getting the work.